Story One of Wounds in the Rain War Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. Story One The Price of the Harness. Parts One, Two, and Three. One. Twenty-five men were making a road out of a path up the hillside. The light batteries in the rear were impatient to advance, but first must be done all that digging and smoothing which gains no encrusted metals from war. The men worked like gardeners, and a road was growing from the old pack-animal trail. Trees arched from a field of guinea-grass which resembled young wild corn. The day was still and dry. The men working were dressed in the consistent blue of United States regulars. They looked indifferent, almost stolid, despite the heat and the labor. There was little talking. From time to time a government pack train, led by a sleek-sided, tender bell mare, came from one way or the other way, and the men stood aside as the strong, hard, black and tan animals crowded eagerly after their curious little feminine leader. A volunteer staff officer appeared, and, sitting on his horse in the middle of the work, asked the sergeant in command some questions which were apparently not relevant to any military business. Men straggling along on various duties almost invariably spun some kind of a joke as they passed. A corporal and four men were guarding boxes of spare ammunition at the top of the hill, and one of the number often went to the foot of the hill swinging canteens. The day wore down to the Cuban dusk, in which the shadows are all grim and of ghostly shape. The men began to lift their eyes from the shovels and picks, and glance in the direction of their camp. The sun threw his last glance through the foliage. The steep mountain range on the right turned blue, and as without detail as a curtain. The tiny ruby of light ahead meant that the ammunition guard were cooking their supper. From somewhere in the world came a single rifle shot. Figures appeared, dim in the shadow of the trees. A murmur, a sigh of quiet relief, arose from the working party. Later they swung up the hill in an unformed formation, being always like soldiers and unable even to carry a spade save like United States regular soldiers. As they passed through some fields, the bland white light of the end of the day feebly touched each hard bronze profile. "'Wonderful get anything to eat,' said Watkins in a low voice. I "'Should think so,' said Nolan in the same tone. They betrayed no impatience. They seemed to feel a kind of awe of the situation. The sergeant turned. One could see the cool gray eye flashing under the brim of the campaign hat. "'What in hell you fellers kickin' about?' he asked. They made no reply, understanding that they were being suppressed. As they moved on, a murmur arose from the tall grass on either side. It was the noise from the bivouac of ten thousand men, although one saw practically nothing from the low-cart roadway. The sergeant led his party up a wet clay bank and into a trampled field. Here were scattered tiny white shelter tents, and in the darkness they were luminous, like the rearing stones in a graveyard. A few fires burned blood-red, and the shadowy figures of men moved with no more expression of detail than there is in the swaying of foliage on a windy night. The working party felt their way to where their tents were pitched. A man suddenly cursed. He had mislaid something, and he knew he was not going to find it that night. Watkins spoke again with the monotony of a clock. "'Wonder if we'll get anything to eat.' Martin, with eyes turned pensively to the stars, began a treatise. Them Spaniards! Oh, quit it! cried Nolan. What the piper do you know about the Spaniards, you fat-headed Dutchman? Better think of your belly, you blundering swine, and what you're going to put in it, grass or dirt. 
A laugh, a sort of a deep growl, arose from the prostrate men. In the meantime the sergeant had reappeared and was standing over them. "'No rations to-night,' he said gruffly, and turning on his heel, walked away. This announcement was received in silence, but Watkins had flung himself face downward, and putting his lips close to a tuft of grass, he formulated oaths. Martin arose, and going to his shelter, crawled in sulkily. After a long interval, Nolan said aloud, Hell! Grierson, enlisted for the war, raised a querulous voice, Well, I wonder when we will get fed. From the ground about him came a low chuckle, full of ironical comment about Grierson's lack of certain qualities which the other men felt themselves to possess. Two. In the cold light of dawn the men were on their knees, packing, strapping, and buckling. The comic toy hamlet of shelter tents had been wiped out as if by a cyclone. Through the trees could be seen the crimson of a light battery's blankets, and the wheels creaked like the sound of a musketry fight. Nolan, well gripped by his shelter tent, his blanket, and his cartridge belt, and bearing his rifle, advanced upon a small group of men who were hastily finishing a can of coffee. "'Say, give us a drink, will ya?' he asked wistfully. He was as sad-eyed as an orphan beggar. Every man in the group turned to look him straight in the face. He had asked for the principal ruby out of each one's crown. There was a grim silence. Then one said, "'What fur? Nolan cast his glance to the ground and went away abashed. But he espied Watkins and Martin surrounding Grierson, who had gained three pieces of hardtack by mere force of his audacious inexperience. Grierson was fending his comrades off tearfully. "'Now don't be damned pigs!' he cried. "'Hold on a minute!' Here Nolan asserted a claim. Grierson groaned. Kneeling piously, he divided the hardtack with minute care into four portions. The men, who had had their heads together like players watching a wheel of fortune, arose suddenly, each chewing. Nolan interpolated a drink of water, and sighed contentedly. The whole forest seemed to be moving. From the field on the other side of the road, a column of men in blue was slowly pouring. The battery had creaked on ahead. From the rear came a hum of advancing regiments. Then from a mile away rang the noise of a shot, then another shot. In a moment the rifles there were drumming, drumming, drumming. The artillery boomed out suddenly. A day of battle was begun. The men made no exclamations. They rolled their eyes in the direction of the sound, and then swept with a calm glance the forests and the hills which surrounded them, implacably mysterious forests and hills, which lent to every rifle shot the ominous quality which belongs to secret assassination. The whole scene would have spoken to the private soldiers of ambushes, sudden flank attacks, terrible disasters, if it were not for those cool gentlemen with shoulder-straps and swords, who, the private soldiers knew, were of another world and omnipotent for the business. The battalions moved out into the mud, and began a leisurely march in the damp shade of the trees. The advance of two batteries had churned the black soil into a formidable paste. The brown leggings of the men, stained with the mud of other days, took on a deeper color. Perspiration broke gently out on the reddish faces. With his heavy roll of blanket and the half of a shelter tent crossing his right shoulder and under his left arm, each man presented the appearance of being clasped from behind, wrestler fashion, by a pair of thick white arms. There was something distinctive in the way they carried their rifles. There was the grace of an old hunter somewhere in it, the grace of a man whose rifle has become absolutely a part of himself. Furthermore, almost every blue shirt-sleeve was rolled to the elbow, disclosing forearms of almost incredible brawn. The rifles seemed light, almost fragile, in the hands that were at the end of these arms, 
never fat, but always with rolling muscles and veins that seemed on the point of bursting. And another thing was the silence and the marvellous impassivity of the faces as the column made its slow way toward where the whole forest spluttered and fluttered with battle. Opportunely, the battalion was halted a straddle of a stream, and before it again moved, most of the men had filled their canteens. The firing increased. Ahead and to the left, a battery was booming at methodical intervals, while the infantry racket was that continual drumming, which, after all, often sounds like rain on a roof. Directly ahead, one could hear the deep voices of field pieces. Some wounded Cubans were carried by in litters improvised from hammocks swung on poles. One had a ghastly cut in the throat, probably from a fragment of shell, and his head was turned as if Providence particularly wished to display this wide and lapping gash to the long column that was winding toward the front. And another Cuban, shot through the groin, kept up a continual wail as he swung from the tread of his bearers. Ay, ay, madre mia, madre mia! He sang this bitter ballad into the ears of at least three thousand men as they slowly made way for his bearers on the narrow wood-path. These wounded insurgents were then, to a large part of the advancing army, the visible messengers of bloodshed and death, and the men regarded them with thoughtful awe. This doleful, sobbing cry, Madre Mia, was a tangible, consequent misery of all that firing on in front, into which the men knew they were soon to be plunged. Some of them wished to inquire of the bearers the details of what had happened, but they could not speak Spanish, and so it was as if fate had intentionally sealed the lips of all, in order that even meagre information might not leak out concerning this mystery, battle. On the other hand, many unversed private soldiers looked upon the unfortunate as men who had seen thousands maimed and bleeding, and absolutely could not conjure any further interest in such scenes. A young staff officer passed on horseback. The vocal Cuban was always wailing, but the officer wheeled past the bearers without heeding anything, and yet he never before had seen such a sight. His case was different from that of the private soldiers. He heeded nothing because he was busy, immensely busy, and hurried with a multitude of reasons and desires for doing his duty perfectly. His whole life had been a mere period of preliminary reflection for this situation, and he had no clear idea of anything save his obligation as an officer. A man of this kind might be stupid. It is conceivable that in remote cases certain bumps on his head might be composed entirely of wood, but these traditions of fidelity and courage, which have been handed to him from generation to generation, and which he has tenaciously preserved, despite the persecution of legislators and the indifference of his country, make it incredible that in battle he should ever fail to give his best blood and his best thought for his general, for his men, and for himself. And so this young officer in the shapeless hat and the torn and dirty shirt failed to heed the wails of the wounded man even as the pilgrim fails to heed the world as he raises his illumined face toward his purpose, rightly or wrongly his purpose, his sky of the ideal of duty. And the wonderful part of it is that he is guided by an ideal which he has himself created and has alone protected from attack. The young man was merely an officer in the United States regular army. The column swung across a shallow ford, and took a road which passed the right flank of one of the American batteries. On a hill it was booming and belching great clouds of white smoke. The infantry looked up with interest. Arrayed below the hill and behind the battery were the horses and limbers, the riders checking their pawing mounts, 
and behind each rider a red blanket flamed against the fervent green of the bushes. As the infantry moved along the road, some of the battery horses turned at the noise of the trampling feet, and surveyed the men with eyes as deep as wells, serene, mournful, generous eyes, lit heart-breakingly with something that was akin to a philosophy, a religion of self-sacrifice. Oh, gallant, gallant horses! "'I know a feller in that battery,' said Nolan musingly. "'A driver.' "'Damn sight rather be a gunner,' said Martin. "'Why would ye?' said Nolan opposingly. "'Well, I'd take my chances as a gunner before I'd sit way up in the air on a raw-boned plug and get shot at.' "'Ah,' oh, began Nolan. "'They've had some losses to-day, all right,' interrupted Grierson. "'Horses?' asked Watkins. "'Horses and men, too,' said Grierson. "'How'd you know?' "'A feller told me, there, by the ford.' They kept only a part of their minds bearing on this discussion, because they could already hear high in the air the wire-string note of the enemy's bullets. 3. The road taken by this battalion, as it followed other battalions, is something less than a mile long in its journey across a heavily wooded plain. It is greatly changed now. In fact, it was metamorphosed in two days, but at that time it was a mere track through dense shrubbery, from which rose great dignified arching trees. It was, in fact, a path through a jungle. The battalion had no sooner left the battery in rear when bullets began to drive overhead. They made several different sounds, but as these were mainly high shots, it was usual for them to make the faint note of a vibrant string touched elusively, half dreamily. The military balloon, a fat, wavering yellow thing, was leading the advance like some new conception of war god. Its bloated mass shone above the trees, and served incidentally to indicate to the men at the rear that comrades were in advance. The track itself exhibited, for all its visible length, a closely knit procession of soldiers in blue with breasts crossed with white shelter tents. The first ominous order of battle came down the line. Use the cut-off. Don't use the magazine till you're ordered. Non-commissioned officers repeated the command gruffly. A sound of clicking locks rattled along the columns. All men knew that the time had come. The front had burst out with a roar like a brush fire. The balloon was dying, dying, a gigantic and public death before the eyes of two armies. It quivered, sank, faded into the trees amid the flurry of a battle that was suddenly and tremendously like a storm. The American battery thundered behind the men with a shock that seemed likely to tear the backs of their heads off. The Spanish shrapnel fled on a line to their left, swirling and swishing in supernatural velocity. The noise of the rifle bullets broke in their faces like the noise of so many lamp chimneys, or sped overhead in swift, cruel spitting. And in the front the battle sound, as if it were simply music, was beginning to swell and swell until the volleys rolled like a surf. The officers shouted hoarsely, "'Come on, men! Hurry up, boys! Come on now! Hurry up!' The soldiers, running heavily in their accoutrements, dashed forward. A baggage guard was swiftly detailed. The men tore their rolls from their shoulders as if the things were afire. The battalion, stripped for action, again dashed forward. "'Come on, men! Come on!' To them the battle was as yet merely a road through the woods, crowded with troops who lowered their heads anxiously as the bullets fled high. But a moment later the column wheeled abruptly to the left and entered a field of tall green grass. The line scattered to a skirmish formation. In front was a series of knolls, treed sparsely like orchards, and although no enemy was visible, these knolls were all popping and spitting with rifle fire. In some places there were to be seen long grey lines of dirt. 
entrenchments. The American shells were kicking up reddish clouds of dust from the brow of one of the knolls, where stood a pagoda-like house. It was not much like a battle with men. It was a battle with a bit of charming scenery, enigmatically potent for death. Nolan knew that Martin had suddenly fallen. What? he began. They've hit me, said Martin. Jesus, said Nolan. Martin lay on the ground, clutching his left forearm just below the elbow, with all the strength of his right hand. His lips were pursed ruefully. He did not seem to know what to do. He continued to stare at his arm. Then, suddenly, the bullets drove at them, low and hard. The men flung themselves face downward in the grass. Nolan lost all thought of his friend. Oddly enough, he felt somewhat like a man hiding under a bed, and he was just as sure that he could not raise his head high without being shot as a man hiding under a bed is sure that he cannot raise his head without bumping it. A lieutenant was seated in the grass just behind him. He was in the careless and yet rigid pose of a man balancing a loaded plate on his knee at a picnic. He was talking in soothing, paternal tones. Now, don't get rattled. We're all right here, just as safe as being in church. They're all going high. Don't mind them. Don't mind them. They're all going high. We've got them rattled, and they can't shoot straight. Don't mind them. The sun burned down steadily from a pale blue sky upon the crackling woods and knolls and fields. From the roar of musketry it might have been that the celestial heat was frying this part of the world. Nolan snuggled close to the grass. He watched a gray line of entrenchments, above which floated the veriest gossamer of smoke. A flag lolled on a staff behind it. The men in the trench volleyed whenever an American shell exploded near them. It was some kind of infantile defiance. Frequently a bullet came from the woods directly behind Nolan and his comrades. They thought at the time that these bullets were from the rifle of some incompetent soldier of their own side. There was no cheering. The men would have looked about them, wondering where was the army, if it were not that the crash of the fighting for the distance of a mile denoted plainly enough where was the army. Officially, the battalion had not yet fired a shot. There had been merely some irresponsible popping by men on the extreme left flank, but it was known that the lieutenant colonel, who had been in command, was dead, shot through the heart, and that the captains were thinned down to two. At the rear went on a long tragedy, in which men, bent and hasty, hurried to shelter with other men, helpless, dazed, and bloody. Nolan knew of it all from the hoarse and affrighted voices which he heard as he lay flattened in the grass. There came to him a sense of exultation. Here, then, was one of those dread and lurid situations which in a nation's history stand out in crimson letters, becoming a tale of blood to stir generation after generation. And he was in it, and unharmed. If he lived through the battle, he would be a hero of the desperate fight at blank, and here he wondered for a second what fate would be pleased to bestow as a name for this battle. But it is quite sure that hardly another man in the battalion was engaged in any thoughts concerning the historic. On the contrary, they deemed it ill that they were being badly cut up on a most unimportant occasion. It would have benefited the conduct of whoever were weak if they had known that they were engaged in a battle that would be famous forever. End of section 1